Good morning, and welcome to the January 30th worship service of Shelbyville First United Methodist Church, the Church on the Square. On this, the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, we welcome those of you here in the sanctuary or those of you viewing the service on Facebook Live and everyone listening on WLIJ. Our pastor is the Reverend Dr. Paul H. Mulliken. Brother Paul's message today is titled, We Are His. It's from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 through 30. Our liturgist today is Reverend Jim Baby. Our musicians are Lori Schuler, members of the Chancel Choir, and we are thrilled this morning to have Haley Helton and Nate Simmons. They're going to be providing a musical blessing for us in just a few minutes. As always, we appreciate the work of our technical team, Rachel Swift, Wayne Crowell, Jeannie Phillips, and Cassie Davis. Right after the service today, the worship and witness ministry team will meet, and we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall in the area next to the kitchen. Also, this afternoon, 5 p.m. tonight, uh, the Confirmation 20, uh, 2022 Banquet will take place in the Fellowship Hall, and I'm sure Brother Paul will have more information about that. Also, tomorrow, the Adult Handbells will meet at 5.30, and then the Education Fellowship Ministry Team will meet at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. This is a reschedule from last week. So if you're on Education Fellowship Team, you meet tomorrow night at 6 in the Fellowship Hall. We want to thank everyone who has already contributed new socks to the Shelbyville Community Soup Kitchen Sock Drive. There's still an opportunity to contribute to this worthy cause. You can bring new socks to the church office tomorrow between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m. If friends are the family we choose, we hope you will choose the children of Aiken Elementary School. There are going to be several opportunities to serve these children in 2022, and it begins with volunteering at Literacy Night, which is scheduled for Thursday, February 10th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. We'll be providing and serving a meal for the parents attending the function and provide childcare during that event. Other opportunities will be available throughout the year. You do not have to be a trained teacher to be involved. You just have to love children and want to help them flourish. If you're interested in making some new friends, please contact Carol O'Brien. Also, we have a prayer team that meets faithfully every Tuesday by Zoom at 930. They pray for everyone listed in our church bulletin and in our church directory. If you have any special prayer needs, please let Joan Leishner know prior to that meeting. You can also email Joan as well. We appreciate that prayer team. It's such a wonderful ministry for our church. Circle 7 normally sends homemade cookies and candy to our college students and those in the service. But due to the circumstances this year, the Circle members instead want to send a Valentine's surprise. And they are asking for the names and addresses of church family members who are in college or in the service. Please contact Edna Lee Borders with names and addresses by this Friday, February 4th. And now we ask that you please direct your attention to the screen for a special video presentation. Because you were there. The hungry were fed. The displaced found shelter. The sick were treated. Clean water flowed. Crops were planted. Livelihoods returned. Communities flourished. God's love was shared. What would the world look like if you weren't there? Let 
us prepare our hearts for worship. Let us pray. God of grace, you've given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, and voices to sing your praise. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and truly worship you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand as you're able as we share responsively our call to worship, which you will find posted in your bulletin or on the church website. People of God, come hear the good news. People of God, take courage in the loving, sustaining presence of God. We are here to find strength and courage, to find faith and hope, to lean on the everlasting, loving arms of God. And let us sing of that everlasting love.
us forgive us if we are open only to the word of the strange prophet and close to the truth when it comes from a familiar face. Excuse the pride that discounts what our neighbors and friends can do, assuming that only the distant expert could be wiser than ourselves. Pardon the doubt that prevents us from doing in our place what others have accomplished in other places, but in similar circumstances. We are sorry if we have blocked the advance of the church of your beloved son, Jesus of Nazareth. Friends, hear the good news. God's love lasts forever. There is no age it cannot touch. Friends, believe the good news of God's grace offered to all. Jesus, we are, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much, Nate and Haley. Uh, that's worth waiting on. We had planned this two weeks ago, and Haley wasn't going to be able to be here. And then the next week, we had snow, and then we finally got it, and we're so grateful. This is half of our confirmation class. They will be joined by Joe West and Pittner and uh, Britton Rose, and it's going to be an exciting time as we share together the next few months. Uh, we'll be leading up to confirmation Sunday, which will be uh, on Heritage Sunday in May, the May the 22nd, I believe, 22nd or 23rd. But keep these young folks in your prayers. They will be having mentors meeting with them. Their parents will be with them tonight uh, or someone in place of their parents, and it'll be a time of starting a, a faithful journey that I hope will continue to last the rest of their lives. Uh, I got a text from Trish Hubbard uh, from uh, Texas uh, that Katie and uh, Scott and Trish's Daughter-in-law, Katie, uh, had her surgery and got home from the hospital on Wednesday and will be 
going to the doctor to see what next treatment for her stage 2 cancer. So keep all of that family in your prayers and traveling mercies, of course, for Trish as she hopefully comes back home this week. Got word that Miss Linda Phillips got a bad report about her eyes that she's been struggling with lately. And so she's going to see a doctor this week to see if there's anything that can be done. So keep Miss Linda in your prayers. And also keep her family, her friend, uh, Jean Cunningham, in your prayers. Jean is, um, had to go to the hospital this past week to have some fluid removed for some congestive heart failure condition. And uh, I think he may have gotten home. I'm not sure. I haven't got that confirmed yet. So, but keep both of them in your prayers. We want to remember those who grieve. Uh, I got the sad news this weekend that another one of my childhood friends, well, he was a little bit older than I was, but his younger sister was a childhood friend of mine from my home church at St. Stephen. Mike was a United Methodist pastor, a colleague of mine, and his sister married a United Methodist pastor, uh, another colleague of mine. So I've known this family all my life, and Mike suddenly passed away Friday night. And so I don't know any of the details. Just keep Brenda and the rest of their family in your prayers. And friends, I'm sorry, but there's still no good news uh, coming from the state regarding the active COVID cases. You may have seen the chart as you came inside. Last week it was pointing this way, and last week it's pointing this way. We've gained nearly 600 more from one Sunday to the other. And uh, we have heard news it's that this surge is kind of lessening up in some areas, but Bedford County hadn't got that order, uh, memo yet, so hopefully we'll get that changed before long. We thank you for watching out for one another and caring for one another. There's also been one more death in our community since that week, and so there's 209 families that are grieving the lo- uh, death of a, lost, lost, a loved one because of, of COVID. If there's other press, prayer concerns that you would like for us to consider, uh, please turn them into the church office, and we'll do our best to include those in services to come. But now let's just accept God's love and grace. Let us breathe in the spirit of our living God who comes to bring peace and hope and new beginning. And let us prepare our hearts as we enter into this time of prayer. O God, who makes all things in love, we join and offer thanks to you for the blessings of life in your world, for the gifts of love and friendship and the joy of family and kinship. Our lives at times reflect your loving presence and, well, at other times seem loveless and lonely and lost. Yet in all things, you do love us, lavishly and without reservation. And you plant within us the seed for loving others. So nurture that seed within us, we pray. Help us to take the risk of opening our walled-in hearts to be vulnerable to the other in our lives and to take the risk of loving others. May your perfect love indeed cast out all of our fear and enable us to give ourselves fully anew to those we encounter on our journey with Christ. Hear our prayers that in those encounters we may more fully share in his ministry of healing, freeing, reconciling love as we lift up to you a world that is broken and often so fearful. We we pray for the leaders of governments and for all people who serve to protect us from harm. We pray for those whose decisions affect the lives of so many And even those small decisions that we may make, which could greatly affect the lives of a few. 
We pray for those who feel unloved or unwanted in this world and for the courage to reach out to them with care and compassion, even as we seek to help those who are sick, imprisoned, lonely, lost, and grieving. The faith and hope you have implanted within us, Lord, has much to offer our world. But without the love of Christ abiding in us, we're nothing. So come now and dwell deep within us. Recreate us as a people more able to love and more willing to love and bind us to one another for the sake of all your world. For these and all of our prayers we offer you in the beloved name of our risen Christ who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come. Now, if the young folks will come forward, we'll have a little time with them. I know we got these two young folks, and we got, is he coming? We got somebody coming from upstairs. He's making his way here. Mandy's on her way. Uh, got, oh, that's right. We got some socks to bless. This is true. And you've got some socks. Good job. And he's coming from where? The outside. Good morning, Mandy. You wake up now? Hi. <laughs> yeah, there. All right. He's got some socks. I'm so glad to have you have them. We'll bless those socks in just a moment. I just want us to play a little game today. There's. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say an idea. Pretend that I'm your mom. I know your mom looks a lot better than I do. You know. <laughs> okay. So pretend I'm your mom and I, I'm telling you something we're going to do. And if you like what your mom tells you to do, You'll go, yay! And if you don't like it, you go, oh, mom. Okay? Let's practice it. If I tell you something you like to do, you go, yeah. Oh, that's exciting. Yes. And, and if I tell you something you don't like to do, no. no. Oh, mom. All right. Got to get it right now, Nate. No, pay attention. Stay with me now. So, all right. Let's say mom says, we're going out for pizza tonight. All right, mom says it's time for you to get in and do your homework. <laughs> uh, let's say mom says I'm baking some cookies. Yeah. All right, mom says I want you to eat your broccoli. <laughs> oh, I knew there would be one. I knew there would be one. <laughs> let's say uh, mom says we're going to the zoo today. Yeah. And uh, let's say uh, we're going to church. Yeah. I'm so proud of y'all. <laughs> But, you know, not everybody says yay to some things that they don't like. In fact, some time ago, Jesus had, in fact, last week we talked about, preached, and I preached about Jesus going to his hometown synagogue, like his home church, and he read the scripture about how God had called him to feed the hungry and to take care, release the captive and do all these tough things that's a challenge to do. And you wonder, like, do I really need to do that, you know? And the church, when Jesus said all that, they said, he, the church said, oh, mom. Well, no, they said, oh, Jesus. You know, they, while he, first they were liking what he was saying, all of a sudden they didn't like what he was saying. In fact, they did more than just say, oh, Jesus. The scripture says they went and grabbed a hold of him, and they were going to take him out of town. And down the road from Nazareth, there is this huge cliff. It looks over the Jezreel Valley. It's a beautiful sight to behold. But Jesus wasn't enjoying the scenery that day because they had all intentions to toss him over that cliff to kill him. They must have really not liked what he had to say. But somehow, miraculously, he was able to slip away from them. So, you know, you have to think about it. What would happen if... Um, if you never did do your homework, you would start failing classes, and that wouldn't be good. What would, 
What would it be if you never ate good vegetables and stuff like that? You know, you wouldn't get strong and everything. What would, what would it be? Oh, I didn't put in there saying, oh, come on, it's time to take a bath. Now, most of us like taking baths now, but some of us still come. Do you like taking baths? I love taking baths, you know. But some people fuss about that. And if they never took a bath, bath what would happen to them? They would smell, you know. And what would happen if we stopped going to church? Hmm. Huh? We wouldn't learn about God. We'd make some bad choices in life. We'd be sad a lot of times in life because we would have our family of faith. You know, we haven't had people now who are, are, are not able to be with us, so they're watching. We're glad they were able to do that. But some have said, you know, I just kind of like it here. And I, but we want to have a chance to be together so we can, can fish bump each other and tell them how much we appreciate one another, right? Well, Jesus was sometimes tells us some things to do. That might make us a little bit uncomfortable. We're like, oh, Jesus, do I really have to love him? <laughs> do I really have to go and do this? I'd rather go play right now. You know, I'd rather just hang with my friends instead of being with somebody that's not very popular. Yeah, Jesus calls us to do some challenging things. But if we make the decision to do what Jesus calls us to do, then we'll find out our hearts will be blessed. And we'll find joy. Now, some of you have brought a blessing. Already, Nate and Haley have shared with us a blessing. But how many of you got a blessing for us? What have you got? Some socks. Are those for you? No, what are those socks for? For other children. That's right. And feed some of our adults here have been bringing other socks for grown-ups because there's a lot of people who weren't able to go to the store and buy new socks. And their socks are... Have you ever had socks that get a hole in them? Yeah. And sometimes that's the only pair of socks they have. And it's been cold outside. And there's some people don't have a, a good warm home to stay in like we do. And, and there's some people that don't have any home. And so you can imagine how cold it's been, how freezing. So these socks will help them to have a little bit to know that God will bless them. And so I, wanna, I want you to hold your socks high as we offer this blessing for these socks, okay? I thank you, Lord, for your love. I thank you for these children who have brought these socks and for the adults that have brought socks. And we pray your blessings upon every sock so that whenever it is given to someone in love that they might sense the warmth of your comfort and grace and know that they are loved by you just as you love us. In your precious and holy name, amen. Thank you for being here. You going to lay them at the altar here? Put them right there. Perfect. Good job. Friends, we have been called to speak and to live out the radical, abiding love of God in this world. And we do so by offering all that we are, all that we do, and all that we have, even if it sucks, knowing that God will use us and our gifts to bring the beloved community ever closer to being realized in this world, ever closer to being open for others to be able to join with us in this journey. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, receive our gifts of self and substance. We give them freely, we give them joyfully, we give them prayerfully, and with them we praise you. With them we celebrate the great power that is love, a love that abides always, a love that radically transforms, a love that makes us whole. Amen. Please remain standing as you're able as we prepare our hearts to hear the word of God. Let's pray. 
God of wisdom, we long to hear your holy word in new and fresh ways. Open our ears to hear your call. Open our minds to understand your truth. Open our eyes to the work of your kingdom and equip us to take part as is ours. Amen. This morning, our scripture reading is from Luke, the fourth chapter, the 21st through the 30th verses. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me the, the proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow in Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of prophet Elisha, and none of them were, was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of the town, led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, choir, Laurie and, and John. Well, those of you who were with us last week, remember that, uh, may, hopefully you remember that we focused on the first 
sermon that Jesus ever offered in his hometown synagogue. Word had spread about all the amazing things he had been saying everywhere else, and, and we can just imagine the headlines that was expected for that day. Uh, local homeboy makes good. Well, today we hear, how I many of y'all remember Paul Harvey? Yeah, I grew up listening to him, and he'd always tell us the rest of the story. Well, today we get the rest of the story, how quickly things can turn and turn bad and ugly very, very bad. In an article in the Christianity Today, in Christian Century, excuse me, uh, Katie Hines Shaw suggests that the reaction, this ugly reaction of the people in, uh, from Jesus' sermon in Nazareth, it was almost like his ministry in min miniature. It reflected how all of Luke's gospel portrayed what happened when Jesus came sharing his good news. She writes that his job, Jesus' job, will be misunderstood, downplayed, and disrespected throughout the gospel of Luke. Jesus was born to an unwed mother and laid in a lowly manger. He wanders the, the back rural backwaters of, of Galilee. He his followers include unleaded fishermen, uh, hungry peasants, and an occasional prostitute or tax collector. His miracles are, are just as likely to occur on the wrong side of the track as on the right side. And he's always insulting the very scribes and Pharisees that could help him, you know, get some prospects. <laughs> it's no wonder, she writes, that Jesus attracts the attractive the attentions of folks like Herod and the Romans dying a, a lonely and dishonorable death on the cross. And even the people of Nazareth here in his hometown wanted to throw him off the cliff by the end of his sermon on this Sabbath day. All of a sudden, they want to be done away with him. Why? All because, well, for a number of reasons, but some way because they wanted a piece of him. They wanted a piece of his power, which seems fair enough. I mean... Uh, they wanted to see him do the things before them as they heard about him doing it other places. See how he turned water into wine. and or, or they wanted to witness the lame being healed or the recovery of sight to the blind. The whole nine yards. They wanted it to see personally what Jesus could do. They wanted to see it. They wanted to experience it right here in Nazareth right now. Thank you very much. This is what they wanted. And if we're really honest with ourselves sometimes. I know we don't like to be really honest with ourselves sometimes, but if we are, we, so do we. <laughs> We've heard all these wonderful, great things that Jesus said and all the wonderful miracles and such, and, and, and you know, that's all what they wanted right there in Nazareth, and, and that's what we want. In our minds, we think, hey, we're members of his community. We've been good Christians for a long time. We're his people. We're the faithful ones. We're here while others are not, you know. So it's quite understandable that we want a piece of the action of Jesus right here, right now, just like the good people of Nazareth. They felt they deserved at least that much. And didn't they contribute to his upbringing? <laughs> I mean, didn't they put up with his unusual parentage? Didn't they go to synagogue faithfully every week? Didn't they study God's word every day? Didn't they pray morning, noon, and night? Didn't they feel proud when hearing accounts of his marvelous deeds that he had come from Nazareth? He's one of us, they said. He's ours, they said. Isn't that why? Hmm. Isn't that why we keep coming back Sunday after Sunday ourselves to, to hear the gospel proclaimed and each month to to symbolically eat his body and drink from his blood at communion, to claim him as our own. Isn't he ours? But listen to his somewhat unsympathetic response. Before, he, he knew what they were thinking before they even said it. He had that kind of insight into people. And he goes to great pains after they were just thrilled with what he said in the synagogue. And he goes to great pains to remind them that our God works in mysterious ways. That, that, that God's power is focused often not on those who have gathered here, but on the strangers far outside the friendly confines of our cozy little 
communities of faith. Where they wanted Jesus to do some of those wonders right there before him, Jesus reminds him of the time when Elijah was sent by God to go to not to an Israeli widow, but to a foreign widow in Zarephath, and then the time when the prophet Elisha cleansed a, a dreaded Syrian, a Syrian of all people. These were folks that good standing Jews don't like and don't want to have anything to do with. But yet, God has been at work in God's word helping these kind of folk. <laughs> While his hometown family of faith was focused only on the people in need right here in their own community in his message. Jesus has reminded them that God always has a knack for looking out for those in need who might be beyond their current communities of faith. Way, way beyond the confines of our towns and even of our countries. For you see, God's power is not ours. And God is not ours. God is not possessed by us. Rather, we are God's. You understand the difference in that? You know, however, they didn't want to be reminded of those biblical stories that may cause them to be stretched way beyond their more comfortable and convenient understandings of God. Instead, when it got to that point, when Jesus started talking about that stuff, <laughs> they wanted to run him out of town on the proverbial rail, tarred and feathered. They wanted to leave him for dead at the bottom of this huge rocky cliff. On some of our trips to the Holy Land, Barb and I have had the amazing opportunity to be up on that precipice and to look down that cliff outside of Nazareth where the people wanted to toss Jesus and let me tell you, it's a long way down to that rocky bottom below. And yet somehow Jesus manages to get away. He escapes. In the same way that God's people had escaped from Egypt so long, long ago in his first exodus after that first Passover. And, and, and all this happened because they really did not hear Jesus in the first place. Maybe this is why we get parts of this same story two weeks in a row. I've always been confused when the readings are assigned like that and you have Jesus preaches his sermon in Nazareth on one Sunday and all of a sudden you get this reaction the next Sunday. Maybe these passages were chosen for these two Sundays after Epiphany because the church father suspected that we too may have not heard what Jesus was saying to Nazareth. We just didn't get it. He says again today... This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture, which Jesus is referring to, is found back in a, the scroll that he rolled open and read from, from Isaiah, the prophet, the 61st chapter of Isaiah. Now, it didn't say the 61st chapter in the scroll that Jesus read because they didn't have chapters and verses back then. But the verse he read came from that prophet and it proclaimed God's care. For all people, even those who were left out, God reverses the fortune sometimes of all those in need. That was the promise that Isaiah prophesied, and that was the promise that Jesus claimed that day in the synagogue in Nazareth. And the operative word in that passage is that three-letter word, all. All. He does this for all in need, not just us in need. If evidently they did not want to share God's or, or, or share God's care with all. God's care is ours, they wanted to say. This Jesus is ours, they wanted to claim. They don't want to hear about a God who cares about Syrians or Zarephathians. How's that, Jim? I don't know, the people from Zarephath. <laughs> uh, and all those other foreigners. All those other folks that are different from us. Those who are not in our denomination. <laughs> no. They wanted God's power and care right there in Nazareth and only in Nazareth. Jesus is one of us. It's not enough of him to go around. He's ours. 
So they missed it. They just missed it, what Jesus was saying. This scripture, this word, has been fulfilled in your hearing. And our hearing of this scripture, of this word, ought to result in our participating in doing what Isaiah said in welcoming strangers. Even Syrians and people from Zarephath and Gentiles of all kind from all over the world. Because you've got to realize the people of, of, of Nazareth who were in that synagogue, you know who they thought were foreigners who shouldn't be included in God's love? Us, Gentiles, you see. I'm grateful that God's love went beyond what they thought. And I need to be grateful that God's love goes beyond what I think and you think. Our hearing this word ought to result in our doing the work that Jesus does. In fact, Jesus tells us in John 14 that those who hear God's word will do even greater things than these that Jesus has done. Wow, that's what he said. Greater things than Jesus did. <laughs> Jesus reminds them that as covenant partners, not contracts based on law, but out of a covenant of love with God, going all the way back to the wilderness, the Exodus, the Ten Commandments, they were the people appointed and anointed by God to live their lives in such a way so they could get to heaven. No, <laughs> in such a way so that they would be a demonstration of God's community of faith, hope, and charity for all people. Are you living in such a way that your life is a demonstration of God's community that is open to care and share the faith, hope, and love for all. What Jesus is saying is, if they get with it, friends, <laughs> turn water into wine yourselves. <laughs> Bind up the brokenhearted. Give hope to those without vision. Liberate those who are oppressed. Release people from their overbearing debts. God has given you the vision of the year of the Lord's favor, so live that kind of life. You don't need me to be around, Jesus says. You already are God's people, called to do God's work, just like me. And Jesus is also saying, do not think that just because you are faithful and in covenant with God that you have some kind of lock on God's power. You do only in the sense that you can give away that power. You can share that power with others. That is to say, our God is not a God who lives only in Israel, not only in Shelbyville, not only in our country, not only in our tradition, not only in in our church or in our denomination or only in our family of faith or whatever else boundaries we would like to set. Again, God is not ours. Jesus is not ours. We are his. We belong to God. It's not so much that we found Jesus, but God found us. So we are to go beyond the boundaries which we or maybe others have set for us, just as Elijah did and Elisha did and Jeremiah did and so many others of the saints of God. Jesus, the Apostle Paul, and all those who have truly heard the word of God in their hearing and in their hearts and in their lives, they know this and, and they live this day in and day out. God calls us to work where and when God pleases. And if the scripture should be fulfilled, it must be in, within our hearing it. 
in our embodying it, in our acting upon it, literally in our being the Word of God for others. As that old adage I heard years ago, you may be the only Bible somebody reads. They say, watch how you live. To become the fulfillment of the Word of God, we need to let go of all those notions that Jesus, this hometown kid, is ours and begin to figure out what it means for us to instead proclaim that we are his. God has a special claim on us, not we on him. And what Jesus said on that day in Nazareth is just as true today. Live the life that Isaiah proclaimed. And God will see to it that all the world will see that good news of Christ shining through all we say and all that we do. This, my friends, is how we become a community of love, a people of faith, of love, of hope, and charity, a people who know that we are his people. We are the sheep of his pasture. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we sometimes find it difficult to proclaim your message when crowds rise up against us. We're sometimes quick to seek our own safety when we know we should be willing to stand up for our beliefs. So we ask your forgiveness for our past failures. And we pray for your power and courage to sustain us in the future, in future encounters with those who are angered by your message of forgiveness and love. God of grace and God of mercy, open the eyes of our hearts. Open the eyes of the blind. Breathe life into the dead. Release those who are bound by sin. And through your Holy Spirit's power, may hearts be changed. May minds be convinced. May wills be conquered. In the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn is, is really a prayer to God. And I ask that you make this hymn your prayer. As we say to God today, take my life and let it be consecrated to thee, Lord. These kids are going to be on a journey of faith. Make helping them to come to the place to make a decision in their life. But I'll tell them that at confirmation, that's not only the decision they're going to make. Throughout our lives, we have to decide again and again and again that we're going to be faithful to God. So I guarantee you, I haven't been as faithful from that day one when I first made that decision. I've had to keep coming back and say, Lord, forgive me. Help me try again. If you're wanting to try again, know that the Lord is open to receive you. Let us accept God's love and grace as we sing this prayer.
every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, thy Lord, at thy feet is treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all. Time has come that God will send us forth with words of love on our lips. Christ sends us forth with acts of love in our deeds. The Spirit sends us forth with the spirit of love, sustaining our very lives and faith. So go in the power of God's love. Be ambassadors of Christ's love and peace to all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Whether you've done so in person, online, or over the radio, we are so glad you've joined us at the, sh- at the Church on the Square. We hope and pray that this week will be a week that you will share God's love with all you meet. Go in peace.